Hey everyone and welcome back to The Leadership Project with your host Mick Spears. We bring you thought-provoking guests and topics every week to challenge your thinking about leadership. Our aim is to help you become the leader that you wish you always had as we learn together and lead together. Hey everyone and welcome back to The Leadership Project. I'm greatly honoured today to be joined by Mike Green. Mike is a master certified coach who travels around the world giving people coaching. He's been to 63 different countries on seven continents and he fundamentally believes that great leaders are forged in the wild, not behind their desk. And I'm really excited to hear today about some of his concepts that he uses for leadership development as he does go around the world helping leaders to find themselves and then become great leaders. So Mike, without any further ado, please do introduce yourself and give us a flavor of that rich background of yours and what led you to be with us today. Well, thank you for having me. I'm grateful to be here. Coming to you from Denali National Park, Alaska. And for 30 years, I've been working in human development. And I've seen the strongest, most sustainable change take place in individuals in the outdoors. And it could be for a period of short period of time, but it has a lifelong lasting effect on that individual. So I believe that leaders are formed in the wild. And when they are allowed to get away from the distractions, they really find their leadership truths of which they lead from and also live life from. So how did you stumble into this in the first place? What led you to be a world traveler? There's a global organization called Outward Bound. And as a senior in high school, I attended a dog sledding and cross-country skiing experience in northern Minnesota. And that opened my eyes to a different way of life. My father was a fourth generation railroader. He had two days off a week. He came, he left the house at seven, came back at four. That's all I knew at the time. But then that really opened up the world to me that there is a different type of work life out there called seasonal. And then also that I experienced myself the lasting effects of of true self-realization through outdoor or pursuits or endeavors. What is it about the outdoors that you believe brings that out? Well, first, it eliminates a lot of the distractions that we have in our day-to-day operation. And I didn't mean to, by distractions, I'm saying the good distractions and the bad distractions, whether it be the 24-hour news cycle, if you will, or your phone that's constantly dinging with everything that's important and then everything that's not urgent or important, but that just distracts us from our, our leadership path as we go on through our career. And when we take people in the outdoors, they really find out who they are, the metal, if you will. They're very... The the self-initiated limits that we have on ourselves, both emotionally, physically, and also mentally, that are just that. They're just limitations that we can work through. And then from that growth comes a lot of understanding of who we really are, or as I call it in my book, truths, our truths. What are our truths about? And it is true that I can do this instead of saying, I can't go out into the woods, in the wilderness and be comfortable, or I can't take a sea kayak for five days and go a hundred 50 miles on a big ocean, things like that. And from those experiences, it's a metaphor, most likely with good coaching, you can use it as a metaphor for a truly life-defining experience. So we're definitely going to come back to both of those concepts about the limiting beliefs and also about finding these leadership truths. I want to dig a little bit deeper around these 63 countries that you visited, if that's still the count, and seven continents. I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you which one is your favorite. I'm just going to ask, what's been the most interesting experience you've had? I would say Western Mongolia with the Kazakh Golden Eagle Hunters. Now, the western part of Mongolia is where the Atalai Mountains are, and that's where the the very interesting and elusive snow leopard lives. And the Kazakhs, their Islamic religion-based or a group of people or culture, and those Golden Eagle Hunters are nomadic. They still are nomadic, and they still live the way their ancestors did. So they were the most interesting. And I write about in the book regarding intention. I learned a lot from them in regards to intention. They live that intention every day, even though it even makes their life even harder. So in such a very, very cruel weather experience, it's just on that aspect, right? There's no trees. They burn animal dung for heat and cook fires to make, to cook their food and such. So it's a very harsh environment. So when you say intention, how does intention show up for them? 
Well, with the Golden Eagle Hunter, their family is affected by the fact that an individual in their family decides that they're going to continue that art form and way of life. So, for example, the Golden Eagle itself gets the best meat, right? for example, or the Golden Eagle gets the best part of the gear, right? The, the round home, some people would call it a yurt. Eastern Mongolia calls that a felt, felt, felt tent, yurt, and Western Mongolia calls it a gear and gets the best part of it. And also, there's a lot of time away from home. The hunter and the eagle are out most likely twice a week for extended periods of time just to bring back fox. Maybe two hunters will go for a wolf or they're out a lot. And the, the main man of the house being gone a lot of the time during what we call a week is takes a, puts a lot of burden on everyone else. What kind of leadership lesson can you take from that you could share with our audience? Well, what I learned and how it became my truth, just observing it was the amount of when we declare something, for example, when we declare something comes from our true being in our truth, they declare that they're going to be a golden eagle hunter. And with that intention, with that declaration and that tension, they have to do this every day. It's a, something that's a part of their lives. And what I learned as a leader that often the people I had the honor and privilege to coach, they start something with an intention that that necessarily isn't all in, for example. And then they end up fighting not only the that intention to get it to the finish line, for example, they're also fighting themselves to give that in leadership experience to give it its all. When they find full attention, intention, excuse me, intention, they find it is a lot easier. You got to go all in for things that you believe, things that you know to be true. And I learned that lesson by observing the Kazakhs after for over 21 days, right? riding with them on horses with a golden eagle on my arm and seeing how much work it really is, but also the bounty that comes from that. They're holding great regard. It's a very proud life, just for an example. So I'll tell you what I'm taking away from that, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. So one is about the intention for sure, and the other one is about identity. So it's about then living that, naming that identity and living that identity. And one of the shifts, one of the mindset shifts that leaders often struggle to make, particularly when they might be in their first leadership role or as they go up through those first few turns in their career, is this shift from leadership is something that I do as part of my job to leadership is my job. How does that sit with you? You're speaking to me today about what I'm coaching an individual through. You and I are on the same page. The people who are successful up until the point where they find out, oh, they've been promoted to now create the same amount of performance with a group of people. But guess what? They've never managed people before. And it is when they really understand their truths that then they can have that intention that I am going now to be a leader, right? that I have to be able to offer crucial conversations to help people develop. That's a leadership quality quality that they, that's the journey that they're on. Much like I always look back at Joseph Campbell's hero's journey to support not only my life, but also my, my, the people I have the honor to coach. And when they step from that known of I've been successful all the way up until this point, because I'm in charge of my own self, but wait, now I'm in charge of others. Now they have to make the de declaration, much like you said, they have to go from being, you know, we're doing leadership. Now leadership is their career. It's much, much different. And it can be a tough transition because they've quite often been applauded and congratulated. Oh, you're so good at your job. And their job was being a software engineer or a nurse or an accountant, whatever it was. They were so good at their job. And now they no longer get applauded about that. They're now making a shift where their job is to lead other people and inspire other people to be good at that job. And there can be a tendency, particularly in those early days, to reach back to their comfort zone because they were good at it. They were good at it. They used to get all of the accolades every time they did a great job at that. And now they've got a shift and the majority of their time is actually spent not doing the craft, but inspiring the craft. It can be a difficult shift, right? Absolutely. And what's interesting is that's why I always come back to what are their truths? What made them successful? And, and so how do you employ those truths that they discover, right? Things that they know to be true about themselves and allow that to be in service to those that they are now leading. And, and again, they're leaving the known what they were getting accolades for. And now it's, they're in a different space where they don't get that. So they don't know what they don't know. And then they have to understand they have to create this. And once they have that shift and, the, and you walk 
with them, you partner with them through this transition, they, in time, they start to get feedback from those that they work with. As long as they're coming from a place of truth, as they come from a place of truth, then people know that they're showing up most likely in service of them. And that's what I believe. So I'm loving this element of finding your truth and then also being in service of others at at this point. A few more questions about your own lived experience. One of the sayings that we have at the Leadership Project is that different is not wrong. I would love to know, Mike, if in your travel, 63 countries, if you've ever come across a culture or a tradition or something that is different, but for you was personally confronting where you looked at it and you went, no, that doesn't sit well with me. Very good question. Well, not to get too deep into religion, I will say that when I was at this time, I, I left from Peru and I went into the Amazoa, which they call the Amazoa, and we went into the frontera. And I knew we were in the frontera because there was no more. The, basically, the, the last checkpoint says, you're in no man's land. And if the shining path comes for you, there's nobody going to come save you. And I was with a uh, religious organization. Just I caught a boat down river with them on the Satipo River. And and when we arrived to these native villages and they were basically wearing burlap sacks. So, and they, we had a boatload of religious charity stuff, everything from books to clothing, to food, to fabric, etc. And also I'll say is that when we got there, when, the, when we went to these villages, unfortunately, and it really didn't sit well with me and the people I was on the boat with, they were in charge of these goods. When they went to these villages and I'm talking, they were villages, you know, uh, mud huts, etc. kind of things. They made everybody get to together and pray prior to them dispensing anything from the boat. And I was like, okay, wow, this is interesting. So, and that happened several times over because we were going far deep in the Amazoa, way deep. And that happened every time. And they really never had a good reason. I didn't ask because I was you know, on a boat with them and they were my ride back, to be honest with you. But I also saw that again, when I worked in Haiti during the earthquake, that a lot of these organizations that give, that are helping organization, just name the one. You can, I'm not going to name any names, but they too used to say, before you can get this, you got to do that. And one organization I worked with in Haiti, Islamic Medical Association of North America, they never asked for anything. They just gave. And that's why I give my money to them for relief organizations. Yeah. So I can, the lesson I'm taking from that, actually, there's a few, but I'll start with this first one. It feels like me an impinging on someone's freedom of choice. All right. So think about Glass's choice theory. And one of the five fundamental human needs is freedom and freedom of choice and freedom from oppression. It doesn't sound like this was oppressive, but it is about freedom of choice and opposed to giving someone information and allowing them to make up their own mind. It was an imposed belief as opposed to a freedom of choice belief. Yeah, I can see how that would be challenging. Is that what I'm hearing there, Mike? Yeah, it was. Yeah. And the second thing I thought of, and it was this picture that came into my head when you spoke about that path and seeing that sign that, you know, beyond this sign, you're in no man's land. The word that popped into my head, and I guess because we were talking about religion, but I'm going to put religion aside. The word that popped into my head in a non-religious way was the word faith. Stepping beyond that sign and following a leader. Think about this in the workplace. You spoke about your known and moving into the unknown. We're often in situations where either the leader asking people for faith in us that we're about to step into the unknown, but we're going to do it together, or we're part of a team where there's another leader and we're putting our faith in them that, yeah, we don't quite see where we're going here. We know that there's something beyond this sign and I'm putting my faith in you. I'm going to go on the journey. And what role do you think faith plays in the leader follower situation? Well, we know that people are motivated differently. Some people are motivated by recognition. Some people are motivated by the excitement of the journey, if you will. And when it comes to this faith that you speak of, we always have to remember what's in it for them or what's in it for me. That's what the whole basic human need is. What's in it for me? And when we say, as you, in your example, we're going to step into the known, we can't just right see it. But when we do reach this, this is what it's going to do. This is what we're going to create. This is the experience we are going to have or something similar of that. 
uh, much like when we go to an organization and they ask us to do their mission or vision statements, et cetera, with them, you know, we are creating something that's currently not there. So let's talk about this and ultimately figure out how or what do you have to that can contribute to this journey? And then what will it look like when we are successful on this journey, for example? And that was where the faith, the faith of leader. That's how I took your question. So I'm hearing here about inspiration around the purpose and around the mission and where we're heading to and having an understanding of what good looks like or what great looks like at the other side of that journey, but then having the faith that, yeah, okay, it's going to be a bumpy road along the way. Not everything's going to go well every day along that trip, but I believe in the journey. I believe in where we're going. I believe in the purpose. And when things do get tough, that purpose is what's going to motivate me to keep going. Right. And I believe in my leader and I believe in myself, right? My, my leader, my ultimately our leader believes in us and that will propel us forward. Right. As opposed to, I believe in my leader. Right. Yeah. I love that. There's almost nothing more powerful than when someone believes in you. It's that feels so good. And then before you know it, you turn around and your own performance exceeds your own expectations because of someone else's belief in you. Right. Or as a coach, when you ask that question that sits with them for days or weeks and they realize the answer and it's the answer is something to do with them. I do. I can do this. I have done this in the past. It's like when we decide what are our experiences in our lives that we have experienced that are a huge foundation or truth of what we are or what we do or how we go about life. And when we go back to those and we come from a place of that, I believe we are in alignment or in congruence. And when we are leading leaders or being led, if we come from a place of congruence, we make better decisions. If we make better decisions, we have better experiences. And if we have better experiences, the people around us have a better, not only experience, but we are reaching our goals or we're propelling ourselves forward, onward or upward, whatever have you. Just add any goal there. So it becomes then self-propelling. It becomes the congruence, the experience, the positivity of that enables you to keep on putting one foot in front of the other. And before you know it, you look back and you realize how far you've come. Right. And with that congruence, there is a modality, right? To use the word, there's a feeling in your body and people have it different places. Think of a time in your life where your body and everything just seems to be congruent. Some people who surf, for example, there is a congruence with their body on a board and ocean and the, the power of that, right? So there is a feeling when you surf that is no like no other. Or when you ski downhill, for example, when you're making those turns or etc. there is a feeling, there's a fluidity. I believe believe that there is that feeling in your body. And if you ask, if a coach or an individual or leader asks the good questions, that person can find that and they know when they're there, almost like a level, a carpenter's level where that bubble is right smack center. That is your leadership congruence, if you will. And if you go back to that and no matter what's going on around you, all the different office experiences and distractions that you're having, and you make your decision based off that congruence, more times than not, you're going to show up far better as a leader, even even things, if things don't go as well, you're coming from a place of congruence and then people will be, you come across more human, the basic way to say it, right? I'm loving this metaphor of the surfing and I want to build on it for a second and see how this sits with you. There's three things that are popping into my head. The first one is the word exhilaration. So when you get to that state, it's very exhilarating. The second one is flow state. You get into that flow state where everything else around you seems to become less significant than what you're doing right now. And, you know, even things like time can become immaterial. Surfers can find themselves, oh, wow, I didn't realize I'd been out here for so long, for example. And the third one I want to throw at you is that a surfer does not curse the waves. A surfer co-creates something of magic that would not exist if it wasn't for being congruent and co-creating with what is around them. So in this case, it's the three things. It's the surf, the wave, the surfboard and the surfer all coming together and without the three components, it wouldn't exist. So it's this co-creation, but not cursing your environment, using your environment to co-create something that couldn't exist if it wasn't for those circumstances. And I think businesses, have a think about what's happening in the business world today. There's turbulent times and I'm not just talking about COVID, I'm talking about inflation, I'm talking about all kinds of things. What do we do? Do we curse our circumstances or do we look to leverage our circumstances is to transform adversity into opportunity and then co-create something that wouldn't have existed if that circumstance didn't exist. How does that sit with you, Mike? 
Well, as you were describing those moments as a surfer, I remember how spiritual it was being looking out over the ocean, waiting for those waves, that next set of waves, right? So you're waiting and you're thinking about what it's going to look like, sound like when you find that wave and how you're going to set yourself up to be successful to ride that wave. And you're looking for those opportunities. And so, for example, using the surface, the surfing uh, analogy here or metaphor, there's usually waves come in a set, right? There's usually about seven or eight, some people say, right? The first wave necessarily is not the right wave, but you're looking for the perfect wave or you're looking for the right wave that meets your criteria, right? So I don't surf often. I learned how to surf in Costa Rica way back in the day, but I know enough to, to understand that there's certain waves for certain types of levels, if you will. And you have to wait to see that. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for the time is right and such. So for me, that really beats. And I can also make another metaphor. I'll be dog sledding on this weekend, tomorrow. And when you're dog sledding with a bunch of dogs, four, or actually I have five dogs, and you're on that sled, the sled is constantly moving in different directions. One right side is, is up and the lower rail, the left rail is down and you have to be fluid with it. Same idea of what you're just talking about right here is that turbulent times, you can't blame it on the conditions because you chose to be out there. And now how am I going to bob weave and make my way through while encouraging this team in front of me and such. There's a lot of metaphors. And there's That's the power of the experience of nature or being out there away from your phones and such is that you can a coach or a person by themselves can ask themselves what really matters and what is the metaphor here like building a fire that's a simple relationships are like building a fire that's what I teach my six and nine year old that relations take time to create you can't just throw big logs on them you got to ease into it I taught my boys how to build fires with flint and steel so what is the steel what is the flint you know things like that There's two things that I'm loving there, Mike, that you're adding and comes back to that working with your environment. So you can't always change your environment. There's many things in your life that you can't change. But rather than curse those things and blame things on your environment, you work with your environment. And then the second one, when you said about selecting the wave that you're going to ride, that's about qualification of opportunity. So here I am, I've got seven waves in front of me. Which one is the right wave for me? And the right wave for me might be different to the right wave for you and the right way for the next person that said, yeah, really, really powerful, Mike. The criteria is very important. We as leaders, right? So that's why it's so important to understand what is the criteria for success or what is it that you, you believe that's needed for that. If you're clear on your criteria and things don't well, you can go back and say, well, I thought that X, Y, and Z was it, but it wasn't. It was A, B, and C and one, two, and three, for example. Yeah, brilliant. All right, I want to come back to now limiting beliefs. We spoke about that before, and we know that limiting beliefs and fear kill more dreams than failure ever did. What approach do you take when you take people out into the wild to help them challenge their limiting beliefs? The intention when they come to me, doesn't matter if it's in the bush of Alaska or you go to Jordan, you go to Wadi Rum or go check out Petra or we go to Scotland for the castles or Nicaragua for the tobacco plantations. What's the intention? What is the reason they're coming? What do they want? Why are they coming? And with that, that's the foundation that we're working on. And then most people who come to me are leaders that just want to get away and do something for themselves for a while and they know something needs to change. And the limiting beliefs that I experience most often is much like one of your podcasts just recently, we talk about if you can wave a magic wand, what would we create? More time, right? What are they utilizing their time that is in line with their, who they are as an individual and ultimately a leader? And and their limited belief is I don't have enough time. And then for example, you say, okay, so so how's that serving you? Well, what are you choosing your time to do, etc. So those are some of those limiting beliefs. And also, so they come with me to me with those beliefs, but they come, if they come to Alaska, for example, their limiting belief about the Alaskan bush, if you will. Now, isn't it interesting? We're talking about two different bushes, right? Yeah, you guys have your bush. We have our bush, right? But it's totally different. They think there's a bear behind every bush, right? They're, they think that they're going to be cold, wet, and miserable all the time. And they are, they're, they will be at times, but when we work through that and then we create a really good coaching conversation around their experiences based off their intention of why they're there. And guess what? Some, most of the time, 
climate changes anyway, because the real reality really sets in when you have seven days away from your phones and you're ultimately talking about, for example, how are you utilizing your time and who should be getting most of your time or what should be getting your attention for your time? Did that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I want to dig a bit deeper. At what role do you think language plays in that? So shifting the words that we use to describe the limiting belief to reframe it with more positive intent. What role does language play? My family would laugh when they hear this. A lot of my friends around me, they say, oh, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. They say, Mike, you never say that. You always say, why is it that you say you're well-scheduled, right? Language does play a huge difference. What's the difference between busy and well-scheduled? And the simple conversation I have with people is like, if you imagine you have a plumbing issue, you call a plumber and the plumber runs into your house and says, well, I'm really busy. I'll do my best to fix it. Or do you want the plumber who comes in nice and easy? I have you scheduled. We're going to get this completed until it takes time, until it's done. So I come from a place of being well scheduled as opposed to busy that's the power of language that's a great example of a reframing so and coming back to similar things that you said before like there's no way that i can do this well what can you do right so switching the question so taking a limiting statement and almost switching it into a question this can apply to yourself or in your leadership with others or even negotiating with someone to switch a limiting statement into an exploratory question of, okay, so what can we work with here? Absolutely. And I do this quite often with my clients, both when I coach them virtually or face to face. It's it's around what can you do and when they come to me out in the bush, there's mountains all around. I say, which mountain looks like the easy one, one one looks the hardest and one looks kind of in the middle. And which one do you want to do tomorrow? Which peak do you want to hit? And they never pick the hardest one, but the next day we do the hardest one because of the language, right? Because you say, Okay, but if you could, how would it feel to do that one as opposed to that one? And it comes down to that Kaizen effect, right? Small increment steps make huge changes. And we live that every day. I fly my clients out to the bush on purpose. And then we hike back to the road. So there's nobody coming to get us. And when they look at it in a map, once the helicopter or plane leaves, they're like, I can't do that. Good news is we're going to take it one step at a time. And we literally do. And it's not like an outdoor coaching question all the time. It's on a 24 hour thing. I'll ask one good question in the morning and then I'll hike ahead of them just enough where they're safe. But I'll let them stew with that question for half a day without even talking to them other than are you all right do you need water things like that eliminating beliefs mother nature kills all precedent right you know they think you think you're gonna go out there and it's gonna be warm and sunny all the time etc and mother nature kills that and we have to constantly be bought to work with it there's no bad weather there's only bad clothing choices right have you ever heard that before All right. Well done, Mike. Okay. So let's get to truths. So you're helping people find their own leadership truth, but I've also heard you say about seven global truths. So what are the seven global truths from your perspective? Well, in my book, Wander Must, A Hero's Journey to Seven Truths, it starts off with me and a client, an oh, aerospace CEO that comes to Alaska and we go out into the bush, much like I've already described. And as I'm coaching him through his intention of being there, what does he want to work through? I'm going back in time about how I discovered a leadership truth on every continent, thus seven truths. Now, my truths could be similar to yours, but there's also, we could have one or two that we share the same term, if you were, or truth, but yours means different than mine. So this is totally yours. My seven truths are not yours or anyone listening. However, the way in which I illustrated in the book is that we go through a life experience and we learn some, we have those very strong and powerful life experiences, whether it be for some, everyone can relate to falling in love at least once in their life. That's a life experience that has fundamentally changed your perspective on things for good, for worse, whatever have you. But think of those life experiences where you've learned something that you you know to be true now. For example, we spoke about Western Mongolia with intention with the Kaza Golden Eagle Hunters. In New Zealand, I learned, and also in Australia, about the truth of being very optimistic. I was there during the earthquake of Christchurch. And so I learned the truth of being optimistic in the heart of total destruction and huge loss. And the loss covers human loss, every kind of loss you can imagine. And so we have those experiences in our lives that define 
define our truths. You know, if you're listening, you're going, okay, well, I'm thinking of a couple of them and you're still not getting it. Okay, great. Imagine five years from now, you are being, there. you're being, there's a surprise party for you and all the people that you really respect are there and they're speaking about you and their experience of your leadership, your way in which you do your life. And they say things about you that really hits you hard in your soul, your heart, your body is like, they get me. They understood me. I never knew that they knew this about me. It's almost like when you receive that perfect gift from somebody that really, really thought about it, that touching moment, that could be a truth. Or what would you want them to say? I did my best, or I was thorough. I was in service of, I was a servant leader. Those are truths. Okay. So we've got intentional, we've got optimistic. So take us through the seven. So we've got five to go. Okay. Well, integrity for Scotland, I was a lumber, what we call a lumberjack in America up there. I, for North America, I hitchhiked from Western New York, which is on the East coast of uh, America, all the way up to Alaska with no money or no food on purpose to teach my 10th grade global history students that you can believe in the kindness of others that took courage. South America was for Ecuador was vision guided nine university students to the top of Cotopaxi eight days out. We did not take a ride to the refugio. We did eight day hike to the base and then up. Antarctica was emotional intelligence. I learned I was there working for the United States Science Foundation and what else is there? And then so I think I have all of them. No, Africa is legacy. I've been to Africa several times and I learned the, the legacy of just to, to experience the history and what is the legacy of all the history there and my legacy because I went there early in my career and then I went there on my honeymoon with my wife and it showed me my legacy. I want to come back to that. Thank you for going through it. I want to come back to that point you said about where other people are talking about you and what you would like to them to be saying about you. So that kind of comes back to a bit of intentionality as well, right? So if we want people to think of us in a certain way, we need to behave in that way. We need to embody those values of what would make us proud. If we were the fly on the wall and other people were talking about our leadership and how we made them feel, what are the words that pop into mind? And then working backwards from there. What actions and what behaviors do I need to exhibit so that that is how they feel about me and my leadership? How does that sit with you? That brings a great coaching question is how are you showing up? And then usually the client stirs in their seat or there's a pause and they go, what do you mean by showing up? Our actions speak louder than our words. The way in which we say things is far more important than how we or the words we choose to use. That's how I answer your question. I answered your question through an experience I just had recently. How do you show up? All right. So let's go with you, Mike. If we were at a service that was dedicated to you and your life, helping leaders find themselves and find their leadership truths, what would people be saying about Mike Green? Well, without a doubt, generous in service. He comes from a place of uh, he's intentional. I would say that he's definitely courageous. The truths that I just named off of you, I would hope that they would mention those. But overall, because I'm a father of two boys, ages six and nine, I would hope that they would say in service of others, right? You and I are in service of others. You create this podcast to serve others, you know, for example. What would you hope people say about you, if I may ask? Yeah, it's definitely in service of others. That would be the first thing that came to mind. Caring, passionate, curious. That'd probably be the key words for me. Curiosity is such a powerful thought process to go to. I do that with my boys a lot. Curious. I was hitchhiking once to college, to my university, when my, my motorcycle broke down. So I had to get to school and I got picked up one day from a, a gentleman, an older guy, and he was telling me about raising his boys. I never forget it. I can tell you exactly where I was when he said it. He goes, yeah, I think parenting is really important. The most important thing we need to teach our children is to be curious of why things are. I remember that. And then I, because my boys were asked questions a lot and I always ask him, so what do you think that is? Or why do you think that person's driving this way today? You know, well, dad, the roads are slippery and they might have bad tires or some things like that. So always wondering, being curious, I think is really a powerful, powerful antecedent to develop. I love the way that you're framing it as a question as well, Mike, that, that example. You could have turned to your boys and said, you know, that driver is driving this way because the, the roads are icy, but you didn't. You framed it as a question. Why do you think he's driving like that? I think that, yeah, that's really powerful. Yeah. So staying curious and building curiosity in others, it makes me think of things like the extreme question experiment from Liz Wiseman. So a leader coming, instead of a leader coming into the room and saying, right team, this is what we need to do 
do this week. Bang, 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 bang. This is what we need to do. It needs to be done by Thursday. And Mike, you're going to do this. And Jim, you're going to do that. Sally, you're going to do that. Chandra, you're going to do that. Instead of doing that, coming into the room and going, all right, team, what do you think our biggest priority is this week? Stay curious and hold space and let them explore. How does that sit with you? It reminds me of the power of intent, right? The great admiral of the nuclear sub. There's a great video of him talking about intent. He took over a nuclear sub and it was in the worst, it was the um, lowest performing nuclear sub in the United States arsenal. And he turned it around and he turned it around by asking, what's the intent of this order or what's the intent of you, your job? And then if you ask people about their intent, then they that frees them up to be able to say why they teach themselves, they teach you and they and to feel empowered by it. I use that word a lot. And my sons play outdoor hockey and supporting the hockey board. And I asked the question the other day in a very respectful way. I said, what's the intent of this board? And they all looked around and like, that's a good question. That's a, that's a hard question to answer sometimes where if people are never or very rarely thinking about that way, you have to ask it in a, you just can't ask it like I just did. I said, so what's the intent of here? What's the intent of this raffle that everyone's not happy about what's been the messaging and are they supporting one another that's the basic three questions i ask and now i'm on this board all right so you get what you wish for sometimes all right i'm gonna ask some of those questions back to you so with mike green leadership and all of the work that you do with people which is a very unique and novel way of doing it what is your intent simply to leave people better than I found them or support people's journey, right? In the hero's journey, eventually the hero in Joseph Campbell's journey meets someone that supports their, has, helps them have that aha moment for a sick conversation. My intent is to be that person. My intent is to be that person that they remember. And so far I've been blessed to be able to be that person. I've officiated four weddings of some of my clients. Some of my clients named their children after me. Some of my clients, unfortunately, who passed away with cancer or had bad experiences in their lives. And they always say things like you made a major difference in my life for me and my family. So I'm honored to be that person. And then Joseph Campbell's work, I believe he's called the sage or it all depends on which Joseph Campbell work you read, but I want to be that person the best I can possibly be. Thus leave people or support people on their journeys to be better than they were when they arrived. The word that's popping into my mind is your African truth of legacy. What makes it important to you to be remembered as the person that left them better than when you found them? That's a very good question. My father passed away when I was 21 years of age. And when people speak of my father, I get a feeling of honor and I get a feeling of wanting to live up to that. And it's that feeling, that modality that I get, that when people speak to my boys or my wife about me, I want them to experience that same feeling of honor to be the son of the man they're speaking of or the husband or the friend of. That's a very good question. That's a, wow, thank you. That's a gift. Thank you for that gift. I love the answer too. And I can see that it's very special to you. So thank you for being very open with us there, Mike. Now, I'd normally leave this until the very end of the episode, but I want to unpack it a little bit more now because I'm sure people are listening to this episode and they've got pictures of you in the wild with your clients. And we've, we've spoken about Alaska, Scotland, Australia, New Zealand, Africa, Mongolia. We've spoken about so many different corners of the world. How do people engage with you, Mike? How do they find you and how do they decide this is for me and which of your leadership adventures is right for them? Good question. We'll start with the easy ones first. People can just find me at mikegreenleadership.com. I work with people virtually, face-to-face. I do workshops as well. And the people who come or I meet them in different parts of the world, that adventure coaching, that's a la carte, if you will. We work and they say, well, I want to, can you meet me here? And we'll go do this. Because I've guided all over the world now. I've, I've guided on all seven kinds. So I've, there hasn't been, there's not many places that I haven't been able to guide people as well as be a coach at the same time. Who comes to me? People who, especially now after the global pandemic, and people had that realization, what really matters and how am I really showing up? They want to do something greater than themselves that's outside the box. And a lot of people come to me for that coaching and then ultimately meet somewhere in the world to experience. They've always wanted to see Petra or they always wanted to go to temple number four and to call Guatemala and see the sunrise and hear 
the hollower monkeys in the morning and et cetera, or something like that. So that's how people work with me. I'm honored that I have been able to live 30 years of human development. And, and I also have the accreditation, a global accreditation that shows that I'm at a level, a high, high performing level as a coach. Took a while to get there, 30 years of that. And then ultimately, you know, 11,000 plus hours of documented coaching, which was the hardest thing about it, just documenting all the coaching hours. So how do they get a hold of me? Mike Green Leadership. It's kind of a long answer, but it's an answer that kind of goes all the way around the world, so to speak. That is a great answer. And it's something that I had not picked up that it's actually the person that's picking their journey. I had this picture of you going like saying, all right, people, I'm doing an adventure in Alaska next month, you know, register here. Whereas you're saying people come to you and go, I've always wanted to go to Kilimanjaro. I've always wanted to go to the Great Barrier Reef. Maybe that's not a good example, but they pick the adventure and then you go and guide them. Yeah. Well, I like I have a team. I have a leadership team coming to the Bush of Alaska this summer. I'll be in Kilimanjaro next September with a leadership team, a board of doctors. So people come to me. Think about it this way: I've had the people come to me because they want to develop both as a leader, as an individual, etc. They want to find their truth, then they want to learn how to live their truth more congruently. Great. And then from that, they learn that there's so much more in life. And then you say, you go, you know, I've watched that since a kid. I've always been interested in that Petra from Leaders of the Rock. Arc. I've always wanted to go there. And then I asked, well, why haven't you? Oh, I can never go there. I don't know. I even know how to get to Jordan. But I mean, where, how would I fly? I said, I'll tell you what, I can, if I can help you get there, do you want to go together? And, and, and having been there before and I know good people there and I know the ins and outs to have a deep, rich experience, you're just not walking by. Oh, that's nice. And then you walk up to the next part. Oh, that's nice. You have a really rich, deep experience that will change your life forever. Would that be something of interest to you? And they go, yes. Okay. So what's the first step to make that happen? Yeah, nice one. You got me scratching my head right now as well. Yeah, where would you like to go? Yeah. Imagine a year from now, imagine you get some news and they say, okay, well, you can go anywhere in the world in the next year and you can have an experience that is rich with culture, rich with development within yourself that is lasting and that you will wear with all your actions going forward that will benefit those around you. Where would that be? So I've been quite blessed in my life. I've been to 40 countries as well, not as many as you, but I've been to 40 countries as well. And every time I've had an amazing experience, it's been immersing myself in a culture that's completely different to the one that I grew up in. So the vague answer would be to visit a culture that's completely different to anything that I've ever experienced. And the short answer would be, I've never been to South America. So it'll be somewhere there and it'd be picking some culture, like it might be Bolivia or somewhere like that and going, Yes, I want to understand how people in a landlocked country live and their culture, their traditions and how they treat each other. Probably be somewhere like Bolivia. That's the first thing that come up, up my mind, but it would be about the experience of a new culture. Yeah, together with a new environment. Obviously, Bolivia is a, a different environment as well, but it'd be about the culture for me. Right. The people who live on the Reed Islands, right? In Bolivia, right? And uh, what's this whole Quechua thing all about? Their language of Quechua and the things like that. And, and the resonance of the or the trails, or the, what we would consider the Inca trails, but the, the, those trails are the catch Anyway, why do they make the noise that they make? And what is the difference between the different hats and the style of hats? And also, but wait, there's more, the color of the ribbons. That all means something. What does this mean, Right. And you heard one of my intentional how I show up is that curiosity. I've got an insatiable curiosity. I always want to know why. Thank you for saying that because that is the currency of true traveling, to understand curiosity. It's not putting a camera up in front of somebody and say, can I take your picture? Then you walk away. Not at all. It's about understanding why is your hat different than that person's hat and why is their hat blue ribbon and you have a blue ribbon, but your hats are different styles. In that part of the world, that means something for women. For men, they wear different kind of hats. It's usually their belts, right? So understanding. And again, you could create that understanding about why is it that my group does this when I ask them to do that? Help me understand why is this taking place? And when we develop that culture where they feel comfortable being able to say is that, well, you come in here on a Monday and you ramble this off and then you leave and we don't see you until Thursday. That's substantially more important to me than the Instagram photo. I want to know why. Not just have a nice pretty picture. I want the experience and I want the knowledge. 
tip on that. Sorry to get me going on this. And I write about it in my book for Mongolia. I bring a Polaroid with me. It's the picture. I take a picture of them first and then hand it to them. And you would imagine how that opens up a dialogue and an experience. Give them something first is huge, huge. And it's amazing. Yeah. In the service of others yet again. And then what happens is a rich experience for both of you. Oh, amazing. I've had, I can tell you stories. I mean, it's a very easy thing to do nowadays. Back in those days when I did it, it was those old school Polaroid. Yeah, very good. All right. So that brings us to a close, Mike. I've absolutely loved our conversation. I'm going to go to our rapid round now. So really interesting question for you, seven continents, 63 countries later, what's the one thing that you know now that you wish you knew when you were 20? That it's okay to be different, that you'll be okay being different. Because at that time, 20, I went to Russia and no one I ever met was to Russia. This is right after Perestroika. And then also I would say, look to what you find, not what you hear, right? Because if I listened to everybody prior to my departure for Russia, I would have never left. But I wanted to go and really understand what is going on over there. Do they really all want Levi jeans? That's really interesting. And I hope that all the young people listening do pay attention to that one. I do see a lot of that not wanting to be different, not wanting to be yourself. And it takes a while to learn that, but the sooner you learn it, the sooner you learn it, the better off you are. All right, brilliant. What's your favorite book, Mike? My favorite fun book to read is Don Quixote. I love that book. That, that's my, one of my favorites. But Abin Batuta's book is really one of my favorites as well. He was an Islamic traveler before Marco Polo. That book actually changed my life. I write about it in my book. In fact, I, there's a huge section about Abin Batuta in my legacy because he wrote that book way back in the day in the 1400s when he was traveling around. When he got back, actually, the quote at the beginning of the book hit me as a fourth generation railroader in a small town in Western New York. And I knew right there, something fundamentally shifted and I knew I could travel the world. That's got to be my favorite favorite because it's started all of this. Change your life. Yeah. Well done. What's your favorite quote? My favorite quote, the quality of my character and the strength of my work has propelled me around the world. That's my quote. Brilliant. And I think that sums up you perfectly in terms of everything you've been doing. And finally, Mike, if people do get in, uh, want to get in contact with you, you've already said MikeGreenLeadership.com, but tell us about your book. How do people find your book and any kind of quick synopsis of what they'll get out of it? The book is called Wander Must, A Hero's Journey to Seven Truths. It has 64 five-star reviews on Amazon. It has a very, very favorable review from Kirkus. And you'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll self-reflect, and you'll ultimately want to give it to somebody else. That's been the reviews of the book. And uh, the book is a really fun, fast read, seven different stories of seven different continents while I'm coaching an individual who's a high-performing, driven CEO, and he has has his own hero's journey in a story. So basically you're getting eight hero's journeys and experiencing different cultures of the world at the same time. Brilliant. So thank you so much, Mike. I've really enjoyed our conversation today and I know our audience uh, will as well. It's been a great privilege to share this time with you and thank you for sharing all of your insights and wisdom today. I'm grateful for your time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Leadership Project at mixbeers.com. A huge call out to Faris Sadek for his video editing of all of our video content and to all of the team at TLP. Joanne Goes On, Gerald Calabo and my amazing wife, Say Spears. I could not do this show without you. Don't forget to subscribe to the Leadership Project YouTube channel where we bring you interesting videos each and every week. And you can follow us on social, particularly on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. Now, in the meantime, please do take care Look out for each other and join us on this journey as we learn together and lead together.